First of all, please let me assure you that I wish you all long and healthy lives. Um, I am, as an obituary writer, used to people taking a step back, perhaps the look of revulsion, and when I tell them what I do for a living, and the jokes. Oh, the jokes. Um, who's on your slab today? Or <laughs> life on the deadbeat, ha, ha, ha. Um, I think that I'm actually writing about life, not death. Death is only the occasion. And I think that the reason people make those jokes and sort of step back and arch their eyebrows and talk about the Siberia of journalism is that we perhaps, well, I think it's because they have a fear of death. And I must say, I'm not eager for death either. I, I suspect I will be clinging as long as I possibly can. But um, becoming an obituary writer does make you think about death more. And uh, I think it's just, it is a part of life. But it's life that I want to talk about today. My book, uh, Writing, Working the Deadbeat, 50 Lives That Changed Canada, is, um, has two main themes. The first theme is the history, culture, and future of writing obituaries. And plus, it has a lot of my experiences on the death beat. And the other part is, of course, the lives of the Canadians I've written about. These are Canadians who died between 2000 and 2010. But of course, they lived <laughs> for a long time before that. So what I'm trying to do is talk about the times in which they lived and use these individual lives to um, talk about significant Canadians, Canadians you may never have heard of, but who are um, certainly interesting and put it all together in kind of a mosaic. And um, I'll step back a minute and tell you that when I first started talking with my publisher, Sarah McLaughlin, House Financy Press, about, I don't know, 18 months ago, about this book, she said, we agreed that there were going to be these two themes, the working of the deadbeat and the, the culture of, uh, and future of obituaries, and then the lives. And so she said to me, so how many lives do you want to do? Pick a number. And I sort of glibly said, well, I don't know, 50. I guess 50 would be a good number. And then she said, and we want you to start in 2000. And I thought, Trudeau. Oh my goodness. Trudeau. <laughs> because I hadn't actually started writing obituaries until, for the Globe and Mail until 2004. I began with Pierre Burton, A Simple Life. And, <laughs> and um, I suddenly thought, hmm, I'm going to have to do a lot of work. And it turned out that it was a lot of work, but it's been very worthwhile because I've learned more than I ever thought I would. So I'm going to tell you, um, first of all, some of the, I want to dispel a couple of myths about the, about the deadbeat. And the first is that all lives um, are interesting. I mean, that's, that's the truth. There's no such thing as an insignificant life. It's just that you don't know what's significant about that life, and that's what requires the work and the, uh, the digging and the research and the talking with people. And the second thing that's really important to know about obituaries is people assume that they're all written, like, I don't know, centuries ago, like maybe in the time of Aristotle, and they're just sitting in a drawer, the morgue, as it's called, and whenever someone dies, you just sort of, oh yeah, there it is, pull it out, slap it on the page. No. If you write it, they don't die. It is as simple as that. <laughs> if you don't write it, the opposite happens. And even if you have, I mean, what happens when you're writing obituaries is that you can start working on somebody and you have to put that person aside because there's a real dead person you have to write about. And that's what happened with me with Pierre Burton very early on in my tenure. I mean, I, I did know Pierre Burton. I had written about him before. I knew he was going to be just huge. So I did start working on him. But then other people died. I, rem I remember on November 30th, 2004, um, a mezzo-soprano named Phyllis Mailing died. 
And she was um, an avant-garde musician. She was really important. She was married to uh, a composer, Murray Schaefer, at one point. She taught many, many students at UBC, and she was herself a renowned singer of the avant-garde type. And I spent all day, perhaps I'd spent a couple of days working on her, and I remember that I had finished it, and I was thinking, six o'clock, I'd filed this piece, I'm gonna, I had a very good seat at the Globe in those days, right by a back door. I was going to sneak out, and the phone rang. And I looked at it, and then I picked it up. And I said, hello, and there was a voice on the other end of the phone, and it just said, Sandra. And I recognized the voice, and I knew what had happened. It was Elsa Franklin, and she was saying, Elsa Franklin was the producer, publicist, uh, friend of Pierre Burton for many years. And I knew what she was telling me. He had died. It was like six o'clock. <laughs> so um, I, I did what one does in that situation. I told my upper editors that Pierre Burton had died. And then they did what they always do in such a situation. They decide they might read my copy. Nothing gets read ahead of time. This is one of the rules of journalism. Journalists don't produce copy until it's absolutely necessary, and editors don't read copy until it's more than necessary. That's the way it works. So there we were. Now, it was, well, so we did it. There's nothing, no choice. The adrenaline runs, you go. I had more or less written this thing, but of course I hadn't finished it. And in fact, they're never finished, to my satisfaction. So there was other things happening that day in the world, though. Um, George Bush was coming to Ottawa for his first, and I don't know, perhaps only, state visit to Canada. He was having dinner with Prime Minister Harper, and it was that night. And so space had been saved on the front page for Bush and Harper having dinner together. Pierre Burton had interrupted that. So I wondered what was going to happen. So I went from where I was working on the second floor, then I went down to the first floor, and I saw all these, I'm afraid to say men, standing around, and it wouldn't be that way now because there are a lot more women in senior management, but they were all standing in a circle, nodding their heads, looking at the ground. And then one of them said, this is bigger than Bush. And I thought, yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> and I think that that is the essential point I want to make about my book. Not that it's any good or, or bad or any of that stuff, but Lives are the essential building blocks of a country's social and uh, cultural history. And I think if you have a collection of lives, that that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And I will tell you um, some of the people who are in the book, some of them are people you will know, of course, Pierre Trudeau, Pierre Burton, June Colwood, um, John Kenneth Galbraith, Rocket Richard, um, Oscar Peterson, uh, Bertha Wilson, the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court, um, and on and on and on. But there are also a lot of people who you may not know or you, who you may have forgotten about. Um, for example, I have uh, a young man who came here at the age of 12 with a, an identity tag around his neck, and he was one of the last survivors of the head tax, um, and he was actually alive and was there in Ottawa to hear Prime Minister Harper apologize in the House of Commons. His story of moving back and forth from Canada to, the, to China, leaving his family behind when the Exclusion Act happened, it's just heartrending. Um, I also have Donald Marshall, the Mi'kmaq who was wrongfully convicted of a murder he didn't commit, and um, who was also twice involved in very important uh, legal cases. The second one was about the historic rights of the Amigua to, uh, to fish that had been granted to them in, uh, during the Seven Years' War. Um, I was able to write about Frank Calder, who was uh, the Nisga chief who was instrumental in getting the, um, the Nisga Treaty the, that settled uh, land rights in British Columbia for so many people. But one of the things that also happened while I was writing this book. I had written many of these people before when I was writing as a daily journalist, the obituary beat. 
But I'd done so many of them in a flurry of phone calls and, and uh, rush and space constraints and so on that I really wanted to look at them again and write them again and revise them. And writing this book gave me that opportunity. For example, I had written about Louis Robichaud, the premier of uh, New Brunswick, when he died in 2005. And I had written about Duff Roblin, the premier of Manitoba, when he died in 2010. And they were both, you know, one day wonders. I mean, I'd done the best I could, but I was never happy with them. So what I was able to do in this book was to take those two lives and combine them because of the uh, liberation of writing in a book rather than the confines of a, of a journalistic article. And the reason I combined them was because they were both very progressive leaders of um, backward provinces. They modernized their provinces. They, um, they became very, very strong leaders. And so by combining them in a single life, um, I was able to bring them together and to talk about things that were important to them and I think important to this country. For example, New Brunswick is the only officially um, bilingual province in this country. And the way they had modernized uh, all the sort of, uh, you know, way you, I mean, they, in New Brunswick, for example, they were still using Pro prohibition era legal law, uh, lo laws about liquor. And uh, in Manitoba, modernized the school systems and so on and so forth, and recognized rights for minorities. I was also able to um, take James Houston. You know, James Houston is the adventurer who went to uh, Cape Dorset and introduced printmaking to the Inuit. Well, when he did that in the early 60s, he had four young men in his studio, and he trained them as technicians. One of them was Kananganak Pudagook, who of course stayed up north after James Houston went south to work at Steuben Glass, who can ever understand that. Um, and Kananganak Pudagook became a very, very important elder in Cape Dorset. He helped form the co-op there, which is a sustaining thing in that community. And um, he went on to become a, really a very prominent artist. So you could see these lives, how even though they were separated, they had connected and they'd flowed one to the other. So there are also people, maybe you don't know Dora de Petteri Hunt, but she was, the, she was Hungarian, she came here after the war, she was penniless, but she brought the artistic tradition of metal making with her and she nurtured it here. And so she was the first person in Canada to sculpt an image of the queen and we carried that image on the coins in our pockets, the ones that jingle in your purse when you're, you know, um, for a long time. So those are some of the people who are in my book, and um, I'll tell you a couple of stories about them. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, for example, I mean, what could I say that hadn't already been said about Pierre Trudeau? I worried about that. I worried about that a lot. And then I started thinking about him, and I thought I wanted to write about him as a man. And so I focused on five I thought, pivotal moments in his life. Um, the first one was uh, the uh, St. Jean-Baptiste Day riots just before he won the landslide election in 1968. The second, you can probably guess, was the October crisis, the imposition of the War Measures Act and Just Watch Me. And what was I found interesting there was here was a man who believed in civil rights who was a very prominent libertarian. And there he was also as the prime minister of the country, charged with the ultimate charge of peace, order, and good government. And how he dealt with those two contrary issues, perhaps, and how he, being the prime minister, doesn't give you the same kind of liberty to, um, to make protests about things. So there was that moment. There was, of course, the patriation of the Constitution. And uh, the moment I loved there was that picture on Parliament Hill, which I'm sure you remember. The Queen is sitting there with sort of a turquoise coat, a sort of a teal turquoise coat and hat, little sort of jaunty thing there. And he is sitting at the other end of the table, and he's smiling. No pirouettes. He's smiling, and his sort of one foot is branched behind the other. It's just the relief after all those constitutional 
uh, battles and the the joy I think he felt himself in having uh, achieved the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and patriated the Constitution. And then there was also his marriage, his surprise marriage to Margaret Sinclair. And you saw this older man with this beautiful young woman and what did that mean and how he withstood all the public humiliation of that marriage. And then finally the moment I chose was the funeral of his youngest son, Michelle, because that moment was really showed him as such a vulnerable person, such a human being, like we all ultimately are. And so I wrote about that. And I want to tell you a little bit about Maurice Rocket Richard, um, who was the first francophone um, hockey legend, and when I was researching him, I found it so interesting to read all the accounts of people who had not seen him play, but had been listening to the radio, because this is really before television when he, when he becomes famous, and uh, they just imagined him. They didn't see him, they imagined him, and so they absorbed that. And so he became a part of everybody in a way, and everybody wanted a part of him. I mean, obviously I wrote about the Montreal riots and the scoring triumphs and so on and so forth, and after he'd, uh, his sort of feelings of being lost after he retired. But what I was really interested in was, was how he was really not a very articulate man. He, in, but he loved his family, he loved hockey, and he loved his country. He tried very hard to enlist in the Second World War, um, but he was always rejected for, you know, mostly because of hockey injuries. But when he died, he was given a state funeral in Quebec, which is pretty unusual for, for an athlete. And even then, there were people sort of trying to pull at him. Uh, Premier Bouchard wanted his coffin dra draped in the fleur-de-lis. Prime Minister Chrétien wanted it in the maple leaf. And so what his family did, which I found so moving, was they said, no, thank you. Um, they put a blanket of yellow roses on his coffin so that he could lie in state as an apolitical person because that's what he was. And I love that about his family because so often you give in to these pressures. And they didn't. And the same thing had happened with his life, actually, when his wife was dying of cancer. He was invited to go to Ottawa because the Queen was going to be there and, and he was invited to a ceremony. She was going to give him an honor and he said, sorry, I can't come. And so the officials said, we'll send a nurse to take care of your wife. You come. And he said, no, I'm not coming. So he missed that opportunity, but they went to him and gave him the, the medal later. And that's because he knew what was important. So um, not everybody in my book is um, an icon. There are rogues, I have a spy, I have a thief, um, I have Dorothy Jowdry, the six shot dot, you will remember, uh, the, the woman who shot her husband six times. Um, not because he was abusing her, but because he was divorcing her. And she managed to get off because she um, had a defense of um, automatism, that she was just not aware of what she was doing. Um, I thought that was an interesting thing, particularly in contrast to having written about Bertha Wilson, who was the first woman on the Supreme Court of Canada and the woman who had actually allowed uh, abuse as an excuse, as a justifiable defense for um, murdering your spouse or, or killing your spouse, not murdering, I would say, in that case. So there are, there are rascals, there's romantics, um, Irving Layton, the poet, who is, um, you know, he's, I think, a larger-than-life character because for all the bombast, all the everything, he was still such a wonderful poet, and he spoke with s such an integrity of language and such a such an ear for language that um, all of that lives on. So there are, as I say, about, there are 50 people, but I've, in the course of writing about, writing about lives, I mention many more. And one of the things I write about as well is um, 
It's a very strange thing when you're writing an obituary because you're talking to family and friends at is what is probably the worst moment in their lives. I mean, someone has died, they're bereft, and you're intersecting with that grief. It's a very privileged position. Um, it's a very humbling position, and it's also a very sad time. I mean, you know, I often when I call people and I say, may I speak with your mother, they say, oh, no, 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 she's not up to it. And I say, well, you know, I really want to talk with her about how she met your father or what was going on when they were younger. And that is somehow easier, I find, than someone just wanting to talk about the last minutes of someone's life when there was pain and sickness and so on. So there's a kind of, there's a delicacy involved in writing obituaries, I have found. I always tell the truth as I know it, but I don't blast it out. Um, I, I, I'm not writing eulogies, I'm writing for readers, so I will include unsavory things in people's lives for sure. And especially my little code that I've learned over the years is, it has to be true, you can't just report a rumor, um, and it has to have had an impact on the person's life. And you want to know the consequence of that and um, how the person dealt with it. For example, I wrote about Dennis Duffy, who, do you remember the crooner Dennis Duffy? He looked like Frank Sinatra, he sang with Tommy Dorsey's band, and he was on a lot of television shows. He was a huge alcoholic, um, so much so that in the 60s, um, he, was, he was dying. And um, he was told by a doctor, if you're actually thinking of marrying that young woman, please don't, because you're just going to make her life miserable, you're not, and you're not going to be here long enough to, you know, to, in, to have any marriage with her at all. And he gave up drinking. Now, what his family didn't want me to say, his family wanted me to leave that out of the obituary. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't. It's true. He's written about it himself. And besides, I said, it is a measure of the man he became that he stopped drinking more than 40 years ago. And what they were afraid of was, um, former drunk also sang as a headline. <laughs> and that's the, um, that's the kind of thing that uh, I don't want to do in an obituary. I'm certainly not going to avoid the truth, but I don't, what you're trying to do is sum up the person's life. And I think that uh, former drunk or head affair with industrialists are not the lead. That's not, you know, the main part of that person's life. It is, um, having written this book, uh, I, I feel that we live in an extraordinary country, and it's mostly the people who've come here, the, um, the lives they've led, and I think together it says something about the world we've inhabited.